Hi, I'm Gabriela Houston, uh, the author of The Second Bell, a Slavic fantasy novel about uh, Striga and her mother. And I'm Caroline Hardega, a poet and novelist and the author of upcoming dystopian book, Composite Creatures, coming out in April. And we are bookish take. Um, with us today is John Baker. Uh, John Baker is a literary agent at Bellomax Morton. Um, John is my agent and uh, <laughs> he specializes in fantasy and sci-fi. And today he's talking to us from the Bellomax Morton offices in North Kent. Yes, very exciting. Of England. How are you? Back with my labeled mugs. Very exciting. <laughs> Thanks for joining yeah, no. us today. Oh, no, thanks for having me. It's going to be great. Um, yeah, it's a glorious day. I, it's it's royalty season at the moment, which is hence why I'm in the office dealing with stacks and stacks of paperwork because publishers are still a little bit old school and they still host us like full on printed copies of things. So oh, I have really? to come in and <laughs> deal with those. So but it's exciting. <laughs> royalty season is exciting. It's when you find out like how well all your authors have done and how much publishers have looked like, how, yeah, how many copies have sold? You get to deal in, de ah, dig into all the numbers. So that's a, it's a, it's it's a fun but busy the, time of year. The moment of yeah. truth, basically. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. It's all chill. It's all chill. <laughs> so we're going to be talking today to John about um, his job, what he does, and uh, how you can catch his interest with your pitches. So. <laughs> John, let, let's start with what made you choose agenting as a career? We were wondering, like, how did you get into it to begin with? Sure, sure. So this is actually, I, have, I do actually have to credit this to my um, English lit and creative writing lecturer, this guy called oh. Dave, who was my, at the end of undergrad, uh, we had a, a, a topic which was what to do with an English lit degree, because of so many people obviously have one. So it was how to get like what kind of job. We did a whole couple of weeks of publishing. And in that he went on, he described the job of the literary agent, this kind of like hard nosed salesman slash champion slash kind of going out there. And I always kind of knew I wanted, like books was the thing I was most, most passionate about. And But by the end of my undergrad, I was very aware that I didn't want to be a writer. I'd like, I knew like writing, writers very, very talented people. I just knew it wasn't specifically one of something that was going to be for me. So but then I knew all I knew about publishing was editors, you know, editors and like, and that kind of level of project management and like hard line editing type work is just didn't really suit my natural um, loquacious talent of never shutting up. <laughs> so I wanted something that combined, you know, loving books and but getting to talk to people and getting to champion and getting to kind of go out there and yeah, and also still with that kind of having some form of editorial input, which I'm sure we'll go into later. So, but so yeah, it's a fabulous combination of a lot. So then when he described this job, I was like, that is all I want to do. So I went over to, I did my master's at Kingston Uni, which uh, fabulous university for publishing masters, anybody plugging there? Anyway, <laughs> um, it's great. It's great. And I did that. And I just remember on the first day, they had the whole classroom, like lecture room full of the whole course room. And everyone was like, what do you want to do? And everyone was just like, I want to be an editor. I want to be an editor. I, to, uh, I was the only person in the room who was like, I'm going to be a literary agent. And then, you know, <laughs> here we are three, three, four years later. And, you know, all the dreams are coming yeah. true. Yeah. Oh. Very linear, <laughs> isn't it? I think so, so many <laughs> people listening will be like listening to that. And it's like, how it's just like a straight line from a to b like just realizing i want to do it to doing it very much <laughs> quite how the ever happens <laughs> yeah i was well, lucky a little, little bit of manifesting a little bit of stubbornness you know just kind of if you just tell people often enough that you want to be a literary agent eventually someone takes pity on you which is <laughs> well i think a lot of people listening um mm. are probably keen to get an agent but mm. The, the life of an agent, I think, is quite hidden a lot of the time until you have oh, one. You're not serious. quite sure what they do. Very serious. <laughs> um, so what what do agents actually do? What do you do? Like, what do you do? OK, <laughs> what do I do all day? Right. So, yeah. well, it's mostly emails. Anyone who says that if you're an agent, all you must do is be reading all day. And that's just not true. It's mostly it's, answering emails and managing kind of like doing that kind of thing is like the actual day to day. But on a broader yeah. schedule, 
the way I see it is an agent is there to look after the author's interests. So, for example, in Gabriella's case, it's my job to kind of um, manage the business side of Gabriella's writing career so mm -hmm. that she can focus on writing all of her amazing books, and doing that kind of thing. So that's coming from like a sales side, getting like um, getting um, Gabriella's books in front of the editors and getting uh, managing neg negotiations and offers and things like that, but also working on the creative side and kind of being the first eyes on something or like first professional eyes on something and having, being able to give in this editorial feedback and kind of work together so we can kind of like doing, I do everything I can to kind of support my author's careers and getting them into a place that they can like be as successful as they want to be. And then, or at least, you know, do my best to make that happen. And that's through, yeah, business side of things and the editorial side of things. And yeah, it's super, super fun. Does that, does that make sense? I was doing a bit yeah. of a but you know, you know vaguely yeah. what I mean, yeah. Totally do. Well, that, makes <laughs> a lot, that makes a lot of sense to me. <laughs> so, yes, of course, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, uh, I was wondering, so um, I mentioned that you sort of specialize in fantasy and sci-fi. Mm. So do you have like, have you narrowed down your kind of primary area of interest yet? And was this 100% your choice? I think people will sometimes wonder is like if what you're listing on your kind of manuscript wish list, is mm. this what you like or have you been steered according to the needs to the agency and like do the senior agents tell you what kind of a client the agency needs as a whole uh, or do you have a completely free reign? Um, I'd say 50-50 but it's kind of everything's just lined up for me quite nicely because when I had my interview with um, Paul and Lauren for this when I started this role I did sit down and said look my specialism from what I've understood, like from a, my first publishing experience was at Galantz, obviously the legendary science fiction fantasy publisher who I love very much. I spent, and I love all my publishers equally. Sorry, just in case anyone's <laughs> you listening. Have to say that. <laughs> just in case anyone's <laughs> listening, I love them all deeply. But um, anyway, yeah, so I started off there, and obviously, but before that, I was always a giant science fiction and fantasy nerd. It's always what I've loved. So that was what I was kind of bringing the skill set with. And there was no one at Bella Lomax Morton who was utilizing that area in any way. And it's, so, and, it's, and it's an area that you really do have to commit and love to, you know, succeed in something, you know, you just cut, it's not a huge area, but it's like niche and need to know. So it's not something to do, you know, casually. So I definitely always knew that was where I wanted to work. And I knew that Bella Lomax Morton didn't have um, anyone doing that at the moment. So when I told Paul, I said after, Paul and Lauren, I said after six months of agency and, um, assistant level work where I was going to support them for the job they hired me for I said I was going to start looking for clients and Gabriella was the very first one honestly which was a which is great oh, um lucky for me <laughs> yes exactly but yeah so it's definitely kind of in bigger agencies especially is that there's a there is a kind of area where agents will have their own niche and they'll have they don't you don't want uh, agents cross competing with each other particularly and you don't want them fighting over clients or fighting up over access to editors and things so it each agency does have an idea of who's going to be working in which spaces, so to speak. But at Bell Lomax Morton, we're a small enough team and we're all quite clear in what our interests are that we don't have too much of an overlap. Like, do, do they give so, you, yeah. um, just a sort of a follow up to this question, like hmm. do, you, do the senior editors, does your boss give you guidelines as to like, okay, so you're representing fantasy and sci-fi, um, but this quarter, I would like you to try and look for um, potential clients who do this kind of a book, who do, do something like this big, you know, blockbuster or whatever. Mm. Do, do, do they give you guidance like that? or um, Not really. I think kind of Paul, rightly or wrongly, has enough faith in my kind of knowledge that he thinks that he knows what I'm going to, I should be looking, well, he knows I know what I should be looking for. And he, I, like, if I need to come to him or Lauren or Joe or any of the two colleagues about like specific clients or ideas about things, I, they, I can obviously go to them, but mostly I kind of free, like I steer my own ship on what I'm looking for. But there is obviously a little bit of, we'll always chat to each other. And for example, um, Joe and Joe working in adult fiction has a, and Katie as well have an idea of which authors are looking at more, which editors are looking into more crossover stuff so there could be more like some overlap there and then obviously I've got um, and Lauren obviously knows does who does her YA and middle grade sometimes she knows which authors are looking which editors are looking for more fantasy end of the spectrum as well so they would possibly look at something if I have any younger projects 
So yeah, we kind of, we share information as far as that. Well, we wouldn't say I get like a shopping list to go find myself from anybody oh. else. Hmm. Well, well, th along the, the submissions mm. line, mm. thinking about the slush pile that you get, um, because I think a lot of people would be interested in the size mm -hmm. of that. Um, how many would you say that you get inquiries a day with, with manuscripts? Or right, so it is, it's quite dependent. As I am still a kind of baby agent, I'm still getting my name and people are getting used to me. And that, so I'm not, I'm sure I'm not as busy as some of you know, the big you know, more prestigious yeah. agents or established agents yet. But if, for example, if, yeah, exactly. but if <laughs> I have a um, busy week, like if, for example, for announcements, like last week, we obviously, or we have week four, we obviously had the fabulous second bell publishing, just plug that as well, just buy it. And then we had, um, I had an announcement as well uh, from one of my other clients. So there was a lot of attention with there was lots of great news that had my name attached to it so i noticed a big pickup in my submissions that week so oh. but averagely i'd say probably between like three and eight ish a day and then right. somewhere between 20 and 50 on a mad week like right. all the, yes and, and, yes, how, all... <laughs> and how long <laughs> in like a is it part of your daily routine that you'll go through them? Do you spend a little bit of time every day or do you do you bulk them together and look at them all at once every so often? Or how do you do that? It's for me, I can't at the moment, it's depending on how much I've got on my plate and how many authors I've already got in the kind of process to towards submission that I look wherever I'm just hitting the slush pile as hard as I could. Because mm. I know the worst thing is when you go in there and you find something you're absolutely in love with, but you know that you're kind of overstocked at the moment anyway so you don't want to kind of go out and offer something and know that you can't yeah. offer an author as much time as you'd like because you've already like committed to the fabulous authors you've already got so it's very much like ups and downs but then there's some like at the beginning of the year I was looking very hard to find some more and I've got a lovely new s selection coming up but I do kind of try and eyeball at least everything that's coming to my stuff <laughs> like inbox maybe once every couple of days at least just yeah. to have a look and see if there's anything that I'd be like dear god i should have to move on this quickly but okay. most of the time i'm kind of just peaks and drops that was a random one but yeah no firm rules just yet makes sense <laughs> <laughs> um i was wondering so when people send you their query mm. um every agent i know have their own uh, has their own favorite bit about the query mm. and but what, what's the most important thing for you so what's the importance of a sort of pitch element and the synopsis mm. versus the first 10 pages okay uh well there was back when i was a young grubby student trying to get into <laughs> agencing i had a i was mentored by the very excellent um sarah sarah hornsley now she's been married since then so she's at the uh, bent agency and she's awesome um, and she would told me about um, some advice that I've always taken on. And it's always about the benefit of a really strong hook. And if you can really, like, if you have a really strong hook in the submission letter saying, like, this is exactly what this book is in, like, a sentence or two sentences. Mm. And you know exactly from there. And you can tell this is, like, you just say these two lines to you, like, two lines to you, and you instantly know what this book is going to be about. And you get the vibe and you get the energy. And that's what I love. Having that's what like really stands out to me, like in a query, and mm. sort of like a some yeah, in a submission pitch. You know, if you can get, hit me with that almost immediately, then I'm all that I'm instantly going to know this is someone who knows what they're doing. So that'd be like the um, the elevator pitch kind of. Yes, the elevator the pitch. Middle. The elevator. Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah. Really, just kind of okay. like yeah. Tell me what it is quickly and possible because it also shows that you know what it is. And you've kind of got a, you've got a head on your shoulders because as much as we want an author who can write beautifully and create incredible worlds and stuff, we also it's also a huge benefit when an author's switched on and knows what they're doing in their own like self promotion, promotion and packaging and things. You know, if they can tell me they already know what the book is and how to pitch it and how it's going to sit in the market, it's already going to be easier for me to kind of start visualizing as well. So, yeah, yeah, I could totally yeah. understand that. Well, is there a particular thing that you see a lot in submissions, either in the manuscript mm. or in the, the cover letter, that's a bit of a pet peeve or something mm. that you see repeatedly, which is a no-no? <laughs> it's, it's, it's almost the exact opposite. I, whenever I see a pitch letter that's more than four paragraphs long, that's when I'm like, right. 
this person doesn't quite get what they're doing. Like sometimes they do, sometimes they've just dumped loads of information in. And like there are rare exceptions when this person is just elevating that they know exactly how to pitch their book and they're talking about like markets and everything, really like detailed like sales pitching stuff. Yeah. But then sometimes you get stuff when someone is just pitching me their entire, every single aspect of their book immediately. And it's like a long stream of consciousness going into okay. stuff that I don't know about. And it's just, I don't need to know about. That always is a massive turn off. And I'm just like, I just, yeah. yeah. I can, I can just, I can like explain, well, not explain, but I can relate to that from the writer's <laughs> side, because I know yeah. if I don't know what I'm talking about, it just gets longer and longer <laughs> and it's just, it's just waffling. It's completely <laughs> waffling on. So yeah, I can totally see that from my perspective. Yeah. I'm guilty of doing that many, many times before. <laughs> it's all right. Oh, it's all right. <laughs> um, um, sorry about that. It's just that's what happens when you're recording during the day. I've been having interruptions coming in <laughs> <laughs> oh, with yes. requests. Um, uh, sorry. So um, what? So say you you know fall in love with a pitch. What's the process mm. like? from then on. I mean, I, I just remembered how impressed I was when I first met you because you, uh, the thing I really loved how, is, was how you brought a pile of notes and <laughs> with all your like ideas about who you could mm. submit the book to, the strategy. You had a few rough edits that made me think like, oh, you actually understand the book. That's really nice. Mm. So um, what's the sort of streamlined process now that you've been through it a few times? You go, oh, God. You, uh, <laughs> I don't know if I can ever say streamlined, but we're getting there. No, I think, um, well, actually, I do have to kind of credit the very fabulous Lauren Gardner, who is uh, one of the se senior agents at the agency who I sit opposite. We used to sit opposite back when we were in the office together. So I used to eardrop, eavesdrop on all of her um, introductory author uh, phone calls. So I had a great proof sheet to go off. So yeah, um, so I've just forgotten the, forgotten the question now. How do we, like, what's, what's the, the process once you fall in love with a pit? <laughs> okay, <laughs> so process is in what do I tell the author or what do I... How, how do you kind of go about signing on a new author? So okay, do, you, do right. you discuss it with the other agents? Right, um, um, so yeah, first, not really. How long does really it take up. you to decide? Oh, a lot of the time, it's usually it's, it's usually pretty quickly. I don't think I don't think any of my clients had, uh, there was ever any like real hesitation, like in my head. It's whether I whether I acted on it straight away or whether I kind of like sat on it for a few days or stuff. But internally, I already kind of knew. I already knew I was going to offer. Like I usually knew. Like so usually know within like in the actual pitch, like at least. The actual, you know, the submit the um, extract, the sample extract. You know, I usually know by the end of that that I'm like mm. pretty much convinced. It's just, and it's just whether the actual rest of the manuscript can follow through. Because sometimes I do read mm. something that's just like, you really, you, I can tell you've spent loads and loads of time on this sample, but then the rest of the manuscript just kind of drops. And that's always a shame, but you know, you just, you can't like, you can't sign someone just for the greatness of the sample. But yeah, so I fall in love with the sample. I'll send her like, I'll send an email, like depending on what mood I'm in. Sometimes it'll be very, very gushy, but then sometimes like that burns both ways because sometimes I've been I can be really, really gushy in the sample saying off oh, the sample, then I send it in, and then they send back the rest and I've really oversold how enthusiastic I should be. And then sometimes I'm like really chill, and then it actually turns out that you know I'm completely in love with the book. And then, you know, it doesn't matter. I'm still trying to find that line. Um <laughs> So yeah, then I'll get the manuscript. I usually try and turn that over pretty quickly. Like benefit of being a young and hungry agent with you no know, real responsibilities in life. <laughs> like, <laughs> so I can, if I'm really excited about something, I can dive in and just like get into it straight away. Um, okay. So yeah, nice. I like to have a nice quiet, tur quiet turnover. And then, yeah, from then, yeah, you, I don't really reach out to anyone else at that point. And then I'll... And then I'll actually reach out to an agent, uh, reach out to the author and say, you know, let's meet up. And but at that point, if I've asked for an, a meeting with an agent, with an author, sorry, it's usually I'm usually going to offer because 
you know, unless they turn out to be like secret fascist or something, and it, like, or which is absolutely zero chemistry when we actually hang out, which thankfully <laughs> has never happened with any of my fabulous authors. So we've always gone. Yeah. Great, so. I mean, I don't know if though. secret, <laughs> I don't know if secret Nazis sort of lead with that. It's just like, <laughs> before we get into anything, before we sit down. <laughs> yeah, just so you know, big on the fourth right. No, no, that would be. Yeah, you're right. That's <laughs> that is true. I hope I don't have any secret Nazis on my list. Well, you'll never know men. now. <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll be even more suspect. secretive now. No, <laughs> you definitely put it not. on the entry form thing or the contract <laughs> yeah. somewhere. Um, but but think I think there is actually that... something on there. So that, oh, is that? <laughs> I can just imagine. Well, if there isn't, there will be. Um, yeah. As we say about the manuscript, um, hmm. so agents now are most often editors as well. So. Hmm. Um, they'll often be the first person that might work with someone on a manuscript. Mm. Did you know that that was going to be part of being an agent? And do you enjoy that part? And how do you feel about it? Um, I love it personally. I did. I did kind of know, but I also knew from my experience in editorial departments before mm. I came into agency that, that like how competitive it is and how like you get special cases, but a lot of the time, editors want a book as polished as possible before they see it because they have to pick yeah. with I saw some horrible statistics on Twitter between people some editors getting like eight submissions from agents a day or something like that and like yeah. that's from agents you know that's eight yeah. books that are fr that are professionally good enough that another person's like putting their career energy into them you know this yeah. isn't like my eight slush pile where I can look at six of them and go probably never gonna work out this is like eight premium quality books so I know that I'm have to. I know that I have to make sure I send out the books I send out are in the best possible condition I can get them to. But also, yeah, it's the be. funnest. One of the funnest parts of the job being able to actually like dive in editorially and really like pull out what to, how to like make the book. Um, you know, bring the book up a level because it's usually I don't. I never sign anyone when I don't already think it's awesome. You know, I just sometimes yeah. I just think maybe we could just take it from like a, a ninety to a hundred or so and so. Yeah. Um, so yeah, diving into that is really fun, and also, like, it's it's the time when I get the most influence on the story. Once I've sold it, I you know my hands are kind of tied. It's like, it's the contract's been signed. You know, it's the it's the publisher's baby, realistically. So that's when it's still in the submission process. It's when I get to you know get put my oar in, have a do a little bit of shaping myself, even if it's like. I think you know needs more bear i think was one of my biggest nights for <laughs> gabriella on the second bell <laughs> yeah <laughs> would you as a, as a kind of aside from that would you ever mm. take on a manuscript or an, a, a new writer mm. where you think the manuscript needs some really really big changes yeah totally yeah absolutely okay. i think but yeah no i've look, i've got the time to dedicate like myself sometimes this is more of a challenge than i expected but that's because i'm learning too you know i'm still getting my um like cutting my teeth on the editorial experience and it's never a chat it's never like disparagement to any of my authors which it was a bit more work than I thought it was but it's just purely because the more I learn the more I know how I can like bring it up more and how I can kind of give the you know guide it more to what the editor what the editors are actually looking for more than I did you know specifically at the beginning of the sample but it doesn't mean there's any like you know any less faith in that in the, in the books that yeah. need a bit more work than the bits the ones that were like relatively shiny already you know? totally yeah I mean I, I know I've like really appreciated um the edits I got from my agent when I signed mm. with him because I, I just I think I knew that they were they had an editorial side but I I didn't mm. really realize how much time he would spend on that on that part of the business working mm. with authors and it was great I know I learned absolutely loads um and it's nice as well when that it's come from an agent because that's somebody who believes in you and believes mm. in the book and knows it can get better. They're not mm. so it's it's hard to take it in a negative way because it just it feels like they're trying to help you do something mm. really good. Um, yeah, so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think one one way I always like to think about it is that we, to a certain degree, agents are working for free. Like to to you, we're investing our time on the belief that we will make that we'll both make money in the future. Yeah. Like, so we wouldn't be bothering if we didn't actually think it was going to be like a, like something that is going to be like rewarding for the both of us. So mm -hmm. it's, I know that's a really like hard nosed financial way of looking at it. But if you take it as a kind of positive spin of that, it's like, 
you know, where this is any kind of labor or effort of an agent is putting into your work is them saying, this is the like, invest the investment without um, guaranteed return that I want to put into your work mm-hmm. that like you should t- be able to really like hang your hat on in a way that for example that like a, that a paid editorial person or a True. or you know someone for someone working for free in a like as a like a reader or something is different you know this is a specific level of yeah commitment I'd say mm, when someone yeah, when you can get to yeah yeah so you've touched sort of on a submission process before. Can mm. you just explain very briefly about how the submission process works once you've sort of polished up the manuscript with the offer and, and, and you feel it's ready to go? Like, how, how does it work? Oh, certainly. Um, so usually, probably starting around the time we like the second edit. So you've got the first edit, which is your big structural, like, we need to change. We could change this. This would be cool. Have you thought about doing this? You know, the big one that's going to take the longest. Once you've done that one, I've got that back. And then I've sent back those like second edit notes, which are like, this isn't quite working. You could just the minuscule ones, the, the quicker one. Around that time is when I'll start having conversations, probably earlier as well. But that's when I'll start having like really hard conversations where I'll pitch, start pitching to editors and say, this is what I've got coming up. You're going to absolutely love this. It's got this, it's got this, it's got this. It's like lions, tigers, bears. It's so cool. <laughs> anyway, you know, that kind of thing. Um, <coughs> excuse me um, so yeah so it's around that time of kind of prepping the editors so that when the editors like when the editors get the um, submission in their inbox they're like oh yeah this is the one John was going about I'm oh, really looking forward to say like reading this so that's when I was do that so at the same time I'll be kind of working on the package we're very very blessed at um, Bell Mac Norton that we actually have an in-house graphic designer the very very talented Rory Jeffers who it work, works on our pitches with us and does like graphics and cool things just to like, to like just to kind of catch your eyes and make an editor sort of like when it lands in an editor's inbox, you know, they get some attention. So that's what we've been working with him on. Um, if they get six, you know, pitches a day, then you have to really make it make it count. It, isn't it? Exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. It doesn't hurt, and it's fun, and it's like we're always so talented. It's definitely always it's definitely worth doing. So we've got him as well, and then we got work on the package. I'll do the submission letter, which does usually look a lot like the submission letter that the editor that the that the author sent in anyway, because you know, there's only so many brilliant ways to describe the book. If you've already done a great job the first time, then we can just tweak it a little bit. And in some cases, it goes through so many changes, like that. Um, it's this. <laughs> The, uh, the, there's lines from the submission letter that end up on the back of the book you know that's the kind of like that's how much those that like uh, initial blurb just gets threaded through like four people four or five different people anyway uh, so yeah I'll be working up the submission letter doing any kind of anything I can do to get the package looking like as polished and cool as possible so it's so the, or the editors have as much information as they need when you send them in yeah, and at the same time, get my editor list ready, call, do my call around to the specific editors that I think, yes, you'll definitely love this. Mm-hmm. And yeah, and there are some editors I necessar- won't necessarily call every time because it's that I wouldn't necessarily think this worth, like, that might not be their, their favorite, but you definitely want to show them. Because it might be yeah. a quick note, because sometimes they'll just be like, oh, you yeah, know, this isn't for us, but you know, thanks for showing us. And sometimes they'll just never reply to you again. Oh. Any of you are watching. <laughs> no, joking, joking, they know joking. who they are. Uh, it's comforting to know that agents have to deal with this as well. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I, I, I've seen a lot of you know kind of uh, hopeful offers who mm. you know have sent out God knows how many submissions to agents and just mm. like got like three replies in a year or oh, something. It's <laughs> just harsh. like nobody's replying, and it feels quite. Um, it, it, it 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 can feel quite sort of harsh <laughs> yeah. yes. so so it's it's it can be a comfort to know that agents have to deal with it as well it's basically well, a never ending stream of no's and no replies well it's just yeah it's it's a, it's the nature of the industry i think definitely in agents case just to play the card that if we like hand replied to every single submission we get we wouldn't actually do any other job work there wasn't any there isn't enough time in the day to hand, hand like specifically reply to every single manage, every single submission you get and like I said, a little bit like that, the kind of harsh side to the fact that I'm saying when I'm working with age authors that I want to work with, I am investing, you know, my time in like in a potential of future return. Investing my time into something I don't is I don't have intent, like any personal belief is going to be a future return isn't a good business model for something for a company. 
you know, if we go, mm. like, I'd love to be able to, like, I don't want to be any disenfranchise anybody, but at the same time, you know, we are, we are, we are utilizing our man hours the best we can. And we have to prioritize the stuff that we actually, we actually think will, you know, have you, a return on You investment. don't create the demand, you basically just respond to it. Yeah, exactly. It's just, it's, hmm. anyway, so yeah, so that's why you can't, as much as I would love to reply to every single person who, in, in, to, who submits to me, it's just, it can't be done. Um, I think we have a uh, time for just uh, one more question. Uh, sure. Yeah. So, um, well, I, I was thinking of it, and I was just thinking. So, for people watching, as mm. of spring 2021, <laughs> what is it you want to see in your inbox next? What are you looking for? All right, I'll give you a kind. Of, I've got a kind of bit of a shopping list at the moment, so I'll just kind of fire through some stuff. Okay. So. I'm kind of st I'm staying in the genre, obviously, which is a great place to be talking about this. So that's where I'm working. So, mm -hmm. as Gabriel knows very well, I love a reclaimed folklore, reimagined folklore, anything kind of building on non-Anglo Christian centric storylines to kind of that I haven't seen as much light of the day as they thoroughly deserve. I absolutely love anything like that. So always hit me up, especially from a like an own voices, underrepresented voice specifically. Always up for love those. Um, I'm desperately trying to find, and I always say this because it's difficult because this is, this is always like, gets me some very strange submissions, but I'm desperately trying to find like lightly comic fantasy, like oh. kind of honor, honoring Pratchett meets or like Nicholas Eames, Kings of the Wild kind of, where it's like there's still a fantastic plot and the mm -hmm. jokes are like, and they, there's maybe like 5% jokes in there, like light, right. light stuff, consistently funny, but like 5%. Whereas I get a lot of stuff which is just like comedy, 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 comedy. Oh, and there's a dragon. You know, like, no, I don't need a stand-up manuscript with a dragon in. You know, I do want you want storyline first, but there can be some kind of humour and like you know the kind of the opposite end of the sale to Grimdark. I have read some funny Grimdark, okay. which is always interesting. Anyway, um, that's kind of in the fantasy space, in the horror space. Yeah, any kind of like light creeping dread i just read mexican i read mexican gothic a while ago now, but when i wrote this <laughs> list it was recently that was fabulous so anything kind of like you know spooky slow burn horror rather than Ooh. full on terrifying is good for me as well i just read um last house on needless street katarina ward's like big gothic oh Ooh. god I, mm. she's good she's, recommendation. she's definitely she shook me up she so if she's up. not happy with her agent, she knows where to go. She's absolutely fine with her agent. <laughs> uh, her agent is a very talented person, and I should definitely, I would definitely not threaten that. But she, it was just a very, very good book. Um, so definitely read that if you want something to really unsettle you. And then <laughs> science fiction, I love a great space opera, like something big and dramatic. Um, and then some kind of speculative thriller type thing as well, some kind of crime mm. with an edge. That's always fun. Like, you know, something weird. I, like, mm -hmm. I just randomly came up with the idea, not myself, I didn't come up with the idea, but mm -hmm. what kind of like courtroom drama type thing, Grisham-esque, except like necromancers are involved and they can bring the oh. victims back to, back to life to, to like give evidence in court. How cool would that be? All right. it, sounds like a complete, <laughs> it sounds like a complete novel to me. <laughs> exactly. I'm not writing it. Somebody else write it and send me it, all right? It just, it just popped into my head. Like and I just thought it sounded cool. That'd be and an awesome YA wise, TV series. <laughs> yeah, right. It would be cool. Yeah. I think that I think you know, like I Zombie. If other people have done vaguely, anyway. Um, and then YA stuff. I, I'm, I like. I have definitely loved YA fantasy. I think it's awesome. I think it's the YA fantasy market's being served very well in the kind of secret destiny princess. Not princess. But, you know, there's a girl ordinary girl who's actually secretly an adventurer type stuff it's 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 great i love a lot of them but i think like i'm not the best um agent to be doing that stuff i so if i want some yo fantasy i'd like something that's doing something really different you know something really weird and wonderful go um, really out there um, we're going to get a calf in a second oh yeah, we've got a minute sorry I'll be quiet. there you go that's my shopping <laughs> list go oh, that's make great that well that is <laughs> wonderful thanks for joining us john you're welcome. Yeah, You're thank welcome. you. It's been great. And uh, everyone, John Baker from Bella Max Morton. So hit him up with your queries. Yes, yeah. you know, you know what to send now. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks.